Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I never can figure out these microphones. Um, in full disclosure, we are taping this um, because this is for one of my class projects, and I will be posting it on YouTube. So I would advise that you not go to sleep <laughs> because it's going be, to be all over the place. All right? And if you don't want to be there, let me know. I'll fuzz your face out later. Um, one last thing before we, before we get started. The last time I spoke was about a month ago. And if you all remember, it was a Sunday night. And I said, if you don't mind, I would really appreciate if you would pray that our baby would come. And I learned that night that this church, when they start praying for something, God answers it. Because Sunday night, we ask you to pray about it. Ethan was born Friday morning. So within about, I guess, what is that, four days, five days? So I know that if we need some, something prayed about, we come to this church, and God's going to hear it because uh, he, he took care of that very quickly. Um, all right, if you have your Bible, please turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 31 through 39. Give you a moment to get there. Okay. Um, as I was preparing for this, as I was preparing for this message tonight, I was I was looking for some way to to introduce the text that we're going to be looking at. And this is a very, very, very famous text. Most a lot of people know the text we're going to look at. It's also a very comforting text. And as I was looking at it, I was thinking, you know, I could probably start my message tonight by by reading the lyrics to a song that I like about a guy who's having a bad day because he has jury duty and he got stuck in traffic and. He, he cut himself shaving, and he forgot his sister's birthday. I was thinking I was going to start that. But then as I was preparing, I came across the story of a guy named Saeed Musa. Have any of you heard of Saeed Musa? OK, uh, Mr. Jenkins has. Most of you have not, which is an absolute tragedy. And the reason it is is because Saeed Musa is a Christian brother who is in prison in Afghanistan right now. And the only crime that he committed was the fact that he's a Christian. He was at a church service. They, they were videotaping the church service. Somehow the videotape got out. The authorities saw him. And he's been in jail since 2009. And, and just reading the story, reading the testimony of him, all kinds of awful things have, have happened to this man simply because he's a believer in Christ. And, and the reason I say it's a tragedy is because um, very soon he's going to be executed if something doesn't happen. Um, so if y'all don't mind praying for him, his name is Saeed Musa. We, we definitely need to, to lift him up in prayer. Now the reason that I mention this is because our passage tonight deals directly with what he's going through. It also deals directly with, with most of the stories that I heard tonight as we were going through the prayer list where, where people are waking up and they're getting test results and they have cancer, or they're finding out that, that there's, there's been a death in their family, or they're finding out that, that something, some type of tragedy, something bad has happened to them. Or it might be that the, an individual has, has done something in the past, and there's somebody who just won't let it go, who keeps bringing it up, who keeps throwing it in their face. This passage that we're going to look at tonight deals directly with that. So if you have your Bible, let's look at... Um, Romans 8, chapter, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. It says this. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature 
shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, like I said, that, that is just, it, it's, it's a very famous passage. It is also amazingly comforting. And, and I'm hoping that Mr. Musa over there in, in the Afghan prison, I'm hoping that he is resting on these words. Now, just to, to set the scene of what's going on here, in chapter 8, Paul has been laying out the argument on why Christian believers have eternal security, that there's nothing that's going to be able to separate them from Christ. Now, as he gets to the end of the chapter, he, he's, he's laid out these arguments, he's laid it all down, um, and he knows that there are going to be some people that are going to bring objections to what he's just said. So Paul, knowing that it's coming, decides to lay out and say, well, let me explain to you why that's not going to happen. All right. They, you know, it, like I said, there might be individuals that continue to bring it up. Well, Paul takes these people, whether they were in his day or ours, head on, and he shows them just how wrong they are. Uh, if you, in, in verses 31 through 34, it basically it breaks down into two sections. Verses 31 through 34, Paul, tells us, or Paul explains to us how no person is able to separate us from our salvation. And then in verses 35 through 39, Paul explains how no situation, nothing we go through, can separate us from our salvation. Um, let's take a look at the first one here. As Paul begins his arguments about no one being able to take away our salvation, he breaks it up into four groups. And these four groups include human beings, God himself, Satan, and Jesus Christ. And Paul lays out for us the reasons why none of these individuals can do that. Let's, let's look at each one um, individually here. Uh, the first one, Romans 8.31 says this, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Um, the, the implication from this verse is the fact that there might be somebody against us. There might be somebody who is trying to separate to separate us from our salvation. In Paul's time, there, there, were, there was a group of people called the Judaizers. I, I think I said that right, the Judaizers. Anyway, they would come to these new believers and they would say, wait a second, you can't be saved. You can't be a Christian because you've never been circumcised. Or you can't be a Christian because you don't keep the Jewish law. Or you can't be a Christian because you eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. They would say these things in an attempt to pull them away, to, to confuse them about their salvation. In our day, we have people that are just like that. We have folks that, that will come to you and they'll say, you can't be a Christian because you dress this way. Or you can't be a Christian because you do these sorts of things. Or because you don't read a particular translation of the Bible. And then vice versa, you've got people who say, oh, because you read a certain translation of the Bible, you can't be a Christian. Or because you're telling people this, you can't be a Christian. So we've got these people that are trying to separate us from it. And, and the implication here is that these people are, are, are setting themselves up to be more powerful than God. If they're trying to separate us from salvation, they're trying to say that, that they're more powerful than God, that they can, they can step in. Fortunately, we have an all-powerful God who can defend us against such people. Psalms 27, 1 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And Psalm 46, 1 through 3 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. If God is coming to our defense, there is no human that can even make an attempt to pull us away from him. This applies even, even to you and me if we try to take ourselves away from our own salvation. And, and the question that I pose to you is, is it possible for us to commit a sin that would cause us to lose our salvation? The answer is actually no. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If there was nothing that we could do, if we were not powerful enough to get salvation on our own, there is certainly nothing that we can do on our own to take that salvation away from us. 
So if, if man can't do it, if an individual can't do it, the, the next one is, can God take away our salvation? Romans 8, 32 says this, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, like I said, if there's no human, then we also have a God who will not take away our salvation. Somebody could make the argument, well, God is omnipotent. That means, and that, that's a big seminary word that basically means God is all-powerful. He's, he's strong enough to do, to do everything. But our verse there, Romans 8.32, clearly states that he's not going to take our salvation. It doesn't make sense that God, who purchased us, who purchased our salvation at the cost of his only son, would then choose to take and discard us and throw us away. I mean, he paid the ultimate price for our salvation. Why would he then turn around and, and discard us and get rid of us? Um, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Oh, I'm sorry, let me, let me say this part here. God went so far, because he, he, he wanted us so much, God went so far as to cause Jesus to become the most repugnant thing to him. God caused Jesus to become sin. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. And Isaiah 53.10 tells us that God was pleased to bruise Jesus because he knew that the end result would be our salvation. Uh, there's, a, there's a very um, influential pastor named John Piper, um, and, and he put it this way. God in eternity looked upon me for seeing my fallenness, my pride, my sin, and said, I want that man in my family. I would do anything to get him in my family. I will pay for him to be in my family with my son's life. 